Good morning. Welcome to day two of MetaScience 2023. Uh, thank you, everyone, yesterday for your attendance, your conversation, the discussion. All of the presentations were excellent, and the discussions were lively. Uh, and so it's just wonderful to see the engagement uh, that we've been having so far uh, it, at this meeting. And we have lots of great things to cover today. Uh, as yesterday, uh, we have uh, concurrent sessions. The next one will start at 9.30 uh, in the same room as before, conference room uh, 120. Uh, and the 9.30 one will be using natural language processing systems in research, challenges and opportunities. So if you're interested in that as a dynamic discussion, please attend. Uh, and for this morning session, uh, Unfortunately, as many of you may have heard, Samin Vazir, who is going to give our opening keynote, uh, it has COVID. Uh, so she is not here and she is not uh, going to deliver that. Um, I will put up a link uh, to her blog where she has posted uh, the talk uh, so that you can see what we have missed, uh, regrettably. And of course, we were uh, desperate, so I'm very uh, apologetic that our replacement speaker will be Brian Nosek today. <laughs> Um, so, as the moderator of this session, it's my task to provide the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> Brian uh, grew up in Davis, California in the shadow of his younger brother. Uh, at Davis High, Kevin, the younger brother, uh, was an All-American water polo uh, player and captain of the basketball team. Uh, he went on to play uh, at UC Davis uh, for basketball, uh, had a very good career there, and then became a coach uh, at UC Davis, uh, for, and has developed in his career and is now associate head coach uh, at UC Davis men's basketball team. And this meant that he was in the newspaper all the freaking time. <laughs> uh, and and it, it's so much so that when he got married, there was a full page story about his wedding in the paper, like he's a freaking celebrity. And I'm convinced that if Brian ever gets an award that should earn a coverage in the local paper, uh, it will have the headline, Coach Nosek's Brother Gets Award. Um, <clears throat> Brian is totally fine with all of that. He's not bitter. Uh, it is a perfectly great thing. He's proud of his brother, yada, 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 whatever. Uh, so please help me welcome to the stage Coach Nosek's Brother. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Brian, for the worst introduction ever. Uh, Samin's talk, which would have been awesome, uh, is available uh, at the link above, so please uh, go do check that out. Uh, if you just Google uh, Sometimes I'm Wrong blog, uh, it will come up if you don't get that down or just snap a picture. What I'd like to uh, talk about today is the general interest in how is it that we think about making research trustworthy. And I want to review some examples of how the public responds to uh, different scenarios, very simplistic scenarios of researcher behaviors and how that impacts uh, their perceived trustworthiness. And then talk about how that may have some object lessons for how it is we think about trustworthiness more generally. Uh, and perhaps uh, in in a very systems uh, sort of way. So one way we might think about how researchers become trusted uh, in public is if they're confident in the claims that they make. They provide certainty of those, and of course, that the claims that they make are correct. And the base argument that I want to start with is that that's the wrong way for us to think about how researchers gain trustworthiness in the community for the validity, the applicability, the relevance of scientific claims for public consumption. Instead, I think the model that we can aspire to for earning public trust in research is to cultivate a community where humility, calibration of claims, representing the uncertainty appropriately, and having as the primary objective true seeking rather than true certainty is the way that researchers become and will be trusted. 
So the context that I want to provide for this is a survey that Charlie Ebersol, Jordan Axt, and I uh, conducted on a broad sample of U.S. adults several years ago where we gave them very simple scenarios and asked them, how much ability do you think this researcher has? How ethical do you think they are? How likely is it that you think their claim is true? And then we just altered the scenarios in simple ways to see how uh, the respondents would react to uh, those three variables given what the researcher did or what happened next. So the baseline question that we had is at the bottom of this here. Researcher X found an interesting result and published it. So the baseline of how much do we think this person is a good researcher, able, how much do we think they are ethical, how likely is it that their finding is true, is always against this baseline of I, I found something interesting and I published it. And if the scenario suggests that there's a in perceived increase in perceived ability, ethics, and truth, it goes to the right. Uh, of, and then if, if the, the scenario suggests that those are, the researcher is less able as a consequence of other things that happen, then it goes to the left. So simple first follow-up information is, I published a result, interesting result, uh, and uh, Stewart succeeded in replicating it. Some other researcher did. What happens? The perception of my ability, it's always in reference to my ability as the original researcher, I'm perceived as more able, the A that's covered by the E, I'm perceived as more ethical compared to that baseline, and it's more likely that the finding is true. Likewise, if Stuart fails to replicate my finding, what happens? Well, I'm, the finding is perceived as less true, and I'm perceived as less, less able and slightly less ethical, just as a consequence of him failing. So in these two very simplistic scenarios, we might have the general conclusion that really our perception, our reputation, the understanding of our trustworthiness is tied to whether we produce truthful claims or not. But I think if we expand this very quickly, we see that these are separable. So let's add complication to those scenarios. Stuart fails to replicate my finding, and then I say Stuart's methodology was wrong, and his result is invalid. What happens to the perception of me in that scenario? Well, I don't affect the perception of the truth value of the claim. It's still, people think about it in the same way if they just knew that Stuart failed to replicate my finding. But they now also think that I am less ethical and less able than that baseline of having said nothing at all. But I could have said, oh, man, Stuart's right. So I agree with his methodology, and I say, oh, maybe I was, my initial result was wrong. Here we see a substantial separation. Research, the public thinks that finding is now even less true, because both of us agree uh, with that. But my ability and my perceived ethics are not just back to baseline of I pr provide a result, but in fact they exceed the baseline of all you knew is that I had found a result and published it. So even though the new evidence suggests I am wrong, I am perceived as even more able as a consequence. Or I could have, Stuart might have failed to replicate. I start a new study, say, I want to figure out why Stuart got one thing and I got another thing. In this case, my perceived ability, perceptions of my ability and ethics are the highest among these, and the truth value perception violates Bayesian principles. All they know is that there's now new evidence of failed replication. But because of my response, the perception is that, oh no, I think I have even a little bit more confidence in the truth value of that claim, despite the failed replication, because of how I am responding uh, to that evidence and pursuing more information. It doesn't require that Stuart fails to replicate, it can also be just my behavior. So I publish a failed replication, challenging my original result. I published one, now I published a, a second, but now it's not true. Truth value is just as responsive as if Stuart is the one that did it. But my perception of my ability and ethics, again, go the other direction, because I'm just trying to get to the, the truth. But if I said, oh, I failed to replicate it, but I, that was a bad study, so I'm going to put it in the file drawer. The negative consequences are just as the same, uh, or even more substantial, as if uh, Stuart had done that, uh, but, and I just criticized it. And then finally, if I just didn't even bother following up, I published something, uh, and then went on to the next problem uh, instead of trying to follow it up. This lowers confidence uh, in the truth value of that claim, 
and lowers perception of my ability and ethics. So in total, especially this final one, it represents that public understands that there is substantial uncertainty in the claims that we make and in the initial studies that we do and that following up is actually a normal, ordinary part of the process. Let's figure out, try to root out error and understand where and when and how uh, these things occur and under what conditions they will emerge. What I want to call particular attention to are these scenarios where the correctness of the claim and the, the reputation of the researcher are fundamentally separated from each other. That it is not about being right, it's about pursuing correctness. It's about how it is that we respond to evidence that challenges our initial ideas, that is the driver of the perceptions of ability uh, and ethics. And so the core local observation is that in these types of scenarios at least, the public responds to an orientation of getting it right over an orientation of being right for what makes a trustworthy researcher. And I think there's a more general point to make, which is the trustworthiness of research is much more about the process of the research rather than about the outcome. Outcomes in science will always be the basis of distrust because science sometimes presents us with things we don't want to see that they challenge our ideologies, our perspectives, our financial interests. There's lots of reasons that I hate some scientific findings because of personal interest I have in those findings. And so if we aspire to a research community where the public just accepts our findings because we're saying that, no, we know, this, that we can be certain about this, we'll never meet that standard and we shouldn't meet that standard. The fact that we have pushback and skepticism and responses, entanglements, all of that is the productive conversation of science. And there will always be some reaction to the truth when it's different than the realities that we hope for or that we want. But that's of course not the right battle to fight, is to have the public just accept our claims uncritically. The approach to trustworthiness that we can pursue and embrace uh, is one of being resilient to that challenge. Trustworthy research is the, is the work that prepares the research so that when it is criticized, valid criticisms can come through because you can see how the work was done and identify where those weaknesses are. But the evidence and the availability of that evidence then is resilient to those attacks of, I don't like this finding and I don't like you for producing this finding. Because those things will occur and so if we can have a substantial evidence base that provides a bul bulwark against that. That's how science maintains its trustworthiness. And the reason that people get so upset about scientific findings that are unwelcome is because science has been so successful in its history in developing understanding. So it is a threat to the ideas and positions and wants uh, that we have now. Uh, but it can survive that and thrive in the face of it. But the Previous scenarios might suggest that this is all just on the researcher themselves to figure out how it is to make sure that their work is trustworthy. But of course, we are embedded in the broader systems of how science operates and rewards researchers for its work. And so how we achieve trustworthiness is not just on the individual researcher, but also on how it is we create and manage that system. And there are serious threats in how it is our system is managed now that can undermine the entire trustworthiness of the enterprise. And so I want to give a case example of that uh, to prompt some uh, discussion uh, in the context of paper mills and predatory journals. Paper mills, if you're not familiar with this term, are authorship for hire. I have a paper, I'm going to give you third author if you just pay me 500 bucks. Uh, and there's lots of these, and uh, someone that's been looking at this uh, thinks that there are hundreds of thousands of papers in the literature that are a consequence of paper mills. Often fake papers uh, that are just selling authorships and sometimes potentially even real uh, research uh, that has sold authorship. And collusion rings with editors uh, and journals uh, for selling this. Right? If we just now get the author to pay, uh, we'll publish it in this ridiculous journal. Predatory journals are a more general uh, concern, which is no peer review, just willing pay for play. If you're willing to pay, we'll publish your work. So there's lots of 
interest and work on how is it that we can deal with these types of problems. Uh, and a lot of the solutions are looking at ways that make it increasingly inconvenient for doing misconduct, making up papers, inventing data, uh, have a predatory publishing, et cetera. And that the, these solutions make it easier to detect misconduct. So for example, if the paper is open access, maybe a little bit easier to figure out uh, when, when these things occur. If, the, if they have disclosures and reporting standards in the paper, maybe that makes it a little bit more inconvenient for people to fake uh, these things. If the peer reviews have to be public and there's these collusion rings, well, that might make it a little more inconvenient to hide uh, that this is, in fact, a collusion ring. If they have to share the data and measures, protocols, et cetera, the more that's visible, the more work that the misconduct has to overcome in order to be convincing that this looks like real research, even though it isn't. The key here, of course, is that this is increasingly inconvenient and it's helping to detect. So those are good things uh, for trying to address this corrosive problem, especially if we're talking about the hundreds of thousands and potentially into the millions of papers that are now a basis for not knowing how to trust the entire literature. But those detection methods ultimately only treat the symptoms of the problem and the underlying cause, why is it that predatory journals exist, why is it that paper mills are successful, is the reward system itself. And if we don't try to address that long underlying cause, then it'll just be a continuous arms race uh, between those uh, that are commercializing fraudulent uh, work uh, and those that are trying to uphold the integrity of the research literature. The basic model that we might think about for why is it these things, these practices, predatory journals and otherwise are thriving, is that it starts with a researcher needs to publish for their, for their job, for their advancement, for having a career. And if a researcher has resources to do that research, has time to do that research, doesn't have an overwhelming teaching load, uh, has training uh, to be able to conduct that research, is part of a scholarly community uh, in which those ideas get generated and uh, developed, and has the support in their institutional contexts, IRBs, space to do it. If all of those things are available, then most researchers get into research because they care about doing research, and so they'll do rigorous research, and then they'll try to publish it. But in many contexts, one or more of those things aren't available, and yet there are demands on the researchers to still publish, still have to produce things. I don't have any resources. I have a 5-5 teaching load. I, there's, there's, where do I do the research? What are you talking about? How, do I, how am I going to do this? So if I don't have some of those things, then predatory journals, paper mills, and these other sorts of solutions actually fill a need for me as the researcher. It gives me a way to meet this demand that is on me in order to have a job. Uh, so it actually is serving my interest, even if I know, transparently know, that this is all fake. Because if it hits the goals that I have for what are imposed on me through my institution or otherwise, then I kind of am stuck. And it's not surprising that I might go that direction. And that's the reward system there is a consequence of multiple agents, universities, publishers, societies, funders, all influencing what researchers do. And those researchers have a mix of motivations. Right? I need money and I need a job. I'm, I'm interested in having a good reputation. I want to make a contribution to science. And I want to feel like I belong uh, to a, this community. But putting those motivations against one another is a challenging thing. If, if I will have no money and no job, then how much can I prioritize making a real contribution? And so we could hope for, we could demand that people change their motivations. You shouldn't, it's, to be ethical, you should not care about having a job. You should do the right thing. And that's a big ask. <laughs> uh, we know that these base needs are fundamental needs. So that's not the right tack to take. The right tack to take is to change how researchers earn those rewards and to adjust the, the stakeholders that are driving those rewards, imposing them on researchers themselves. But the problem is even deeper because those institutional agents also have motivations. Motivations to have money, 
motivations for reputation, motivations for contribution, motivations for belonging. So institutions that are in nations or environments or other places where they feel like they need to increase their status may impose those expectations on researchers because they have to address the motivations that come from their own context, right? The government policies that say, we need to be better in research in our nation, so damn it, produce more research. The university says, well, we don't have any money, so we'll just make a requirement uh, for researchers to produce more research. Or if they're worried about their ranking systems, and the ranking systems actually credit how many publications you have, it's no surprise that institutions who are competing for students and competing for money will be responsive uh, to that. So if we don't tackle those fundamental problems, we will always have this challenge of researcher uh, misconduct and misbehavior. So it is great for in the now to make to pursue detection, make these types of misconduct more inconvenient, try to expose them and address them, but we need to continuously be working on the medium and long term of changing what is actually required to achieve publication. For example, the model of registered reports is less convenient for fraudulent behavior because you have to prepare and have reviewed in advance what you're going to do, and then you have to do it, and then you have to publish uh, what you did. And in the long term, we have to be working on those institutional agents because if we don't change them, none of it will change. So I want to end noting that the reason that science ends up being trustworthy is because of its constant self-skepticism, its willingness to confront itself and its evidence for how it is we can become trusting of that evidence. What survives that inquiry uh, that we are all part of? And if elevating that is, helps us. Elevating the argument and the disagreement and the challenge is what makes science lively and also makes it so that we feel like okay, what is able to get through that system is stuff that we can really count on. So thanks for tolerating the replacement, and thanks. I'm happy to have any questions. Dan, please. First question. This is exciting. Um, so the PLOS biology paper, I think that's the one that you yes. used to frame this talk, is about asking people how they update their beliefs about truthiness and so on, or truthfulness. Um, in the abstract of that paper, you described the sample population, which is undergraduates and I think other researchers. So I was wondering, what can you tell us about work that's followed up on this looking at other populations, for instance, the general public? And is there any results around the kinds of people that update in one way versus another? Thanks. Great, thanks. It is cruel to ask about the actual abstract because that means you read the paper and I can't just BS my way through answering, but that's great, great question. The data I showed is a general public sample. The sampling group claims that it is representative and I don't believe that it is based on the demographic data we have all these sampling firms claim that they pull representative samples, and they do not. Uh, that's a different talk. Uh, so it is a general sample. Uh, the, uh, there's other studies in that paper that are focused on undergraduates uh, and researchers, uh, and that's uh, evaluating, uh, does, doesn't matter, it's evaluating other parts of, of research credibility. But the point still remains is how much do these extend, and we don't know, we've, we've not followed up on this. Uh-oh, uh, that means for our reputations. Okay, uh, we will follow up on this because that's a way for us to be more credible in our work. Uh, but the, uh, the core is that the, across this pretty diverse sample, it the pattern was very consistent uh, wh wherever people's experience with science was uh, and otherwise. But it'd be really fun to try to pursue uh, much narrower domains where people might have different points of view on science in the first place and see how they are responsive to this. Do you have any hypotheses about that? I, I don't, but thank you for your humble answer and I'll update my priors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right, yeah, good, thanks. Please, Kevin. Uh, thanks, this is great. The systems level discussion critique was, was really, really on point. But I see here at the end, we, and throughout the talk, you're sort of conflating science with the contemporary academic science. It wasn't always this way, and it doesn't always have to be this way. 
uh, certainly we're seeing the increasing politicization of science and, and specifically academia in certain American states and throughout the world. And so I take the point that we can't actually be closed and ask people to trust us, especially given the internet. Um, but I wonder in the experiment you run about where we should choose to be open. So the uh, stimuli you were showing were discussing individual papers being replicated or not. And certainly we've seen a lot more of uh, media reports about individual papers being replicated or not in the past decade. It doesn't seem at a macro level that trust in science in that decade has gone up, right? So uh, my question is where should we choose to be open and, and at what point do we need to have the public involved in what we're doing versus at certain points what could be done behind the scenes? Yeah, that's a great question. And my default answer given my organization and role is that it all should be open all of the time, uh, but maybe not. Uh, so I, so this is point of view speculation, is that I think we benefit from radical openness if our aim is trustworthiness. Uh, and the reason is, is that people care when it's relevant to them to care. And that's a good thing in the sense that if you make the entire process open, well, when am I going to wade in to actually interrogate it, that evidence and respond to it and be reactive to it or whatever else? Uh, it'll be when it matters uh, to me. And so just within the research community itself, I am highly attentive to things that are in my research area. And I might even pay attention to it at the onset uh, of some of this work. But I, stuff that's just on the side, like emotion research, I, I don't even pay attention to it until there's a review because I don't do, I'm not an emotion researcher, but I know that I need to kind of understand what's going on in the emotion field for the things that I think about. Uh, and I think the same plays out in the public for broader issues. Where I think I'm wrong about that is on highly controversial issues. So research on abortion, gun violence, you know, the things that really are the polarizing topics, when that research is open right from the start, it creates more avenues for bad actors uh, to potentially engage it. And I, I want to still think that openness there is the best way for science to go, but there are obvious risks and even like health and harm types of risks that people in highly controversial areas will confront. So I don't know what the right answer is there. Do you? That's, I think that's great. I just, <laughs> you know, I, I think Bad actors, so it's political actors, and we are political actors, and I think we can't pretend to not be political actors, and so maybe. Yeah, thank you. A tough question. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Martin Bush, uh, University of Melbourne. Um, Brian, you've spoken as eloquently as you um, always do about the need to shift uh, cultures and um, in um, incentives and supports. Um, but it seems that at, at the end of the day, we're still talking about the unit of credit for science is the individual publication. Is there, do you see no future for academia where all of these other behaviours which support um, credible science are genuinely part of a reward system, contributing to collaborations in non-research ways, being a good mentor, providing service to societies and institutions? I, I'm optimistic that it can be diversified. Uh, to be better include those things. And I think they do include, at least in my own experiences of very direct evaluations, hiring for uh, new faculty in the Department of Univers uh, University of Virginia, our tenure process, what I observe is attention to all of the things. And nevertheless, that primary currency is the publication in a, in a research institutional context. Uh, and I don't think we can get rid of it as a key currency easily, uh, because it is a useful mechanism of communication. It is a useful way of summarizing. And there's different models of what a publication is, right? Micro-publishing, we can think about different components and units. We can diversify what a publication is. But I think the products of research will be hard to not have be a critical incentive for researchers, because that is what we're doing. We're producing some kind of products. So I start with that assumption of if that's at least in the terms of that we can foresee will be, a, will be part of the, a key part of the incentive system. How do we address that? And then if there are other models that emerge where you don't even need that 
Uh, we can all just edit Wikipedia together. Uh, awesome. Let's, let's try, try those and see what can scale up and how it is that credit could be allocated in an effective way. So thanks for that. I, I, these are all very, very hard questions that I wish you hadn't asked because I don't know how to answer. <laughs> uh, so please. Thanks for a great talk, uh, Ted Hodap from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Um, I was going to ask you about the full court press, but that's for your brother. Um, um, so you were talking about the, the pressures uh, on at what I would kind of say this side of the the argument. What about the other side of the argument? So how does the pressure that we impose within the system help to make the science better? And so can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, great. Yeah, because the, the strength of in incentives is also a force for good. Uh, right? We, and I almost always frame this in terms of the, the dysfunctional uh, incentives because we recognize those and we complain about those so much. How do we fix it? But the whole point is to align the incentives, not to get rid of them, but to align the incentives with the values that we have for scholarly work. How do we make it in a researcher's interest to be more rigorous and transparent and reward them for that? Uh, because rewards matter. We, we might idealize the concept of, oh, if we just eliminate reward systems, researchers will just do it through genuine intrinsic interest and we'll all learn. But that's obviously not the case. We, we need those reward systems as part of natural human behavior. And so the key, I think, is how is it to think about how is it that each of our agents of driving incentives can shape those in a way that really promotes productive collaboration, productive competition, productive engagement on the ideas that we have. So thanks for calling that out. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. It's time for one more uh, question. Thank you so much. I'm Anna Hatch from HHMI. Um, and I'm trying to square sort of a couple of slides. So the, <clears throat> the systems level diagram you had with at the top, there are pressures on institutions such as university rankings. And then the long-term strategy, um, of course, is changing the incentive system. And I'm wondering <laughs> how rankings fit into that strategy. Um, yeah, so the, it's a great question. And I would love for there to be some uh, summit meetings between those that create and manage the rankings and those that have thought about these issues of how the rankings are presently dysfunctional but maybe could be more functional uh, to see if there is any, uh, any way to close the gap uh, for making, transforming those. The challenge, of course, is that the people that are operating ranking systems, U.S. News in the, uh, in the U.S. and the more global ones, they, they get a lot of benefit from having those rankings. It, it is really in their interest to have them. Uh, and so if we're going to make any progress on them, I don't think we can say you need to get rid of your ranking systems or that we're gonna, just going to stop caring about them. Uh, what we need is for them to reform those rankings, at least in the near term, so that they're actually, again, in, incentives aligned. What is it that we want universities to be? And can we provide, create indicators and metrics so that universities can strive to be that? rather than hit the benchmarks uh, that are presently uh, driving those rankings. The, I would love to think that we could just r remove care about those, but universities also have to be responsive to it because the consumer is responsive to it. The student pays attention to those things. So I don't think we'll get rid of them. I think we have to reform them, but can we? I don't know. So thank you. Okay, we are past time, so thanks very much uh, for... Uh, uh, yeah.